Hi, David Bizard here, and you are watching Power Attack 10. If you can afford a few minutes of your time, I'm going to give you the benefit of over 50 years of race winning experience. So what's the subject of this episode 28 of Paratec 10? Well, it's something a little different. This here is a 186 head casting from the late 60s and early 70s. Now, and, and you'll see that it's blued up here. That's because I was working on these heads before I got to do this introduction. But anyway, note the chamber shape. There's more than one cylinder head with this chamber shape. I think the O49 is one of them, but uh, this type of head was the head to have back in those days before there were any aluminum heads available. Now, you might think, well, this is old technology and stuff like that. Yes, it is. But by the same token, we've had 50 years to find out what works on it and what doesn't. And this is what I'm going to do here. Not only am I going to resurrect this cylinder head here, I'm going to show you some moves that are very unlikely to have been either on your agenda or have crossed your path. So let's talk about that now. A brief history of these heads will be in order here. Because we're going to make some moves that are very unconventional. First, back in the day, and that was kind of my day as well, they were the heads to have. And uh, this is what was used for racing. My first, uh, how shall I say, meeting with these heads was on a Lola T70 for McKechnie Racing in England. Uh, most of you won't have heard of McKechnie Racing, but David Hobbs, who has been a long time uh, race commentator, used to drive for them. Now, we had this Lola T70 and it cracked the heads. And the owner had just bought the car and he was a confident race car driver, but he had not got an international license, only a national one. Anyway, I had to rush around and find some heads to grind. And like I said, this is my first introduction to Chevrolet. Well, folks, you might notice I've got a different shirt on. Good reason. It's a couple of days later, I had a rush job to do. But anyway, back to the story. Uh, had three weeks to uh, not only find some cylinder heads, but also figure out how to do them, because I'd never done any before. Well, I managed to get some from a, a wrecking yard that uh, was right next to a US Air Force base, where a lot of cars that had been involved in accidents over the years and I guess Americans got involved in accidents a little more often than the English guys for the simple reason that they were driving cars on the other side of the road with steering wheels on the other side to England. So once in a while they would make a mistake and forget. Hence, crashes. Anyway, I managed to find some heads and I had three weeks to go from start to finish made it by the skin of my teeth. I spent a very intense uh, couple of weeks on the flow bench and I finished the heads uh, uh, from start to finish in one week. I had some, I managed to get three cylinder heads. So that was good. How well did they work? Just fine. We picked up 50 horsepower over the opposition. To give some kind of chance of these heads not cracking, I stuck with the 1.94 intake valve right. and worked on them from there. I also minimized uh, how much metal I cut to deshroud them, but it was very scientifically done, and I think 
what happened was I managed to get the bare minimum of metal out to get the results I was looking for so any weakening of the chamber was significantly less anyway got the heads to McKechnie Racing that's the team that David Hobbs used to drive for you know David Hobbs the commentator uh, on uh, uh, one of the big channels can't remember not to worry the cracking problem seen on the US modified heads was a real issue. Basically those heads would last about one race. That means anywhere from 75 miles to maybe 300. Uh, and they were expensive. By the time you stuck on import duty in today's money we'd be talking about eight nine thousand dollars a pair for a set of cast iron no make that twelve thousand right so it was expensive so I had an opportunity here maybe to supply heads to far more than just McKechnie Racing the cylinder heads I was working on were intended for a 302 inch Lola T70 and it was destined to race for its next race at Hockenheim in Germany. The driver was a novice international driver. In other words, he had a national license, he was experienced, but he'd never done an international race before, let alone raced at Hockenheim. But he was pretty good driver. Anyway, when he arrived at the track, he made the mistake, and it turned out that it wasn't, but that's fortuitous, of asking the Surtees team, as he passed their three Lola T-70s, what final drive they were using. So, realizing that he was a novice, they didn't give him the right information. They told him one ratio higher than they were actually using. As it happened, the extra power that our engine was making here was pretty much all in terms of foot pounds. So they inadvertently advised him with the perfect ratio for the track. For a driver new to the track, our guy qualified pretty good. I can't remember the position on the grid, but it was better than expected. Anyway, Flag comes down and off they go and it's not too long before he's passed every single 5 litre sports racing car out there, Lola or not. By the end of the race he's tagging on Brian Redmond's rear bumper. Well not quite, he was probably 10 or 15 feet behind him. Now Brian Redmond is or has been multiple champion in so many race divisions that you can put him down as a world-class driver. And here's our beginner at international events, new to the track, new to the car, comes zipping in in second place. Well, this caused a lot of commotion in the pits after. Everybody knew that this guy must have a 400-inch engine. Well, it was suitably protested and suitably stripped down. And guess what? 302 inches. I can tell you, as soon as word got around that I had done those cylinder heads, my telephone about fell off the wall. I had orders for about 90 sets of heads within, I don't know, three weeks, a month, just on that one outing alone. Unfortunately, there was no way I could cope with them all. So, uh, didn't pan out as well as it sounds in, in practice. Well, you can see what the background is for these heads, or these head mods that I'm going to show you here on these 186 heads. I know that some of the uh, folks out there are going to say, well, we could go out and buy a set of good heads and that. Well, so you can. You won't learn any porting skills, though. But the other thing is, is although these heads are very old, like 50 years now, 
the technology that we're using on them isn't. We've had 50 years to find out what makes them work. Well, that's what you're going to get delivered. So porting a set of these heads is going to get you a killer performance. Now, interestingly enough, if you don't want to port a genuine set of double hump 186 heads, then Trick Flow does an aluminum replica which will port up in pretty much the same way here and you'll have more material to play with. So if you follow the tips that I give you here, you could get even more performance out of their heads than I'm getting out of these. If you want to go the cheap way, do it. All you've got to do is find some 165 valves. You could use secondhand 1.94 valves out of a, a, a Chevrolet. You know, the valves aren't going to be that particular. But if you want to do this at home, trust me, you can get a hard charging engine out of it. Here's our 186 casting. Just for reference, here is the casting number, right? The head's referred to as a 186 casting, and that's the last three digits of the number. To get the head shot blasted and crack tested. These heads are prone to cracking through here into the water jacket if they've ever been overheated. If they're modified and you take too much metal away from here, they crack. We are going to see if we can install, there's enough seat area to install a 194 valve, 1.94, smaller. And we will put in a 1.650 exhaust valve. Why is this? Well, the smaller valve will be less shrouded. We are limited on how much we can take from here without the head cracking. So we're going to forfeit some intake flow, won't be much, but we'll pick up some exhaust flow, which means we'll need a cam with a slightly different timing to make the best of it, but that's okay. What we're looking for here is a head modification deal that will be reliable without cracking at these key points and make good low-speed torque whilst making some pretty decent top-end power. Our first move is to locate some gasket locating dowel pins and spray dicom on the head. Before you start doing anything, make sure all the oil seals are taken off the guides. Then, using some of this awesome stuff you can get from uh, Dollar General, right, spray the heads down, or the head, brush through the guide, give everything an, another spray down, brush it all off, and then dry off what you can with tissue until it gets down to a state where you can blow it off with an airline. Dab what you can dry with tissues and then finish it off with an airline. And to prevent it all going rusty, a waft of WD-40, not too much, otherwise the marking glue that we're going to put on in the next step won't stick. When you apply the dicom, you need to only do it in strategic areas, right, and that's around there, 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 using tissue. With lacquer thinner on, wipe the valve seat clean as you see here. Install the dowel pins. Now locate the head gasket. And remember, this is the block side. 
the head side that's the upside is underneath scribe round the bores what we are now going to do is to put Prussian blue onto the rim of the valve and we're doing this to see if when we put this into the head that it blues up the head with and shows us whether or not we have enough room to uh, put smaller valves in right here we go with the smaller valves Well, from this shot here, although it's not terribly clear, you can see that we do have a platform available to us to put in the smaller valves. Here's another valve that's got a more clear picture of what we're trying to show. So, in spite of the fact that these seats were cut for a 202 valve, they were not cut to a size uh, such that we are left with enough material to install a 1.94 valve. That's good news. Let's take a look and see what's been done so far. Right, let's remove, this is my Goodson 3D um, cutter which uh, goes on this pilot here which I use my digital readout to center now first move on all the chambers was to cut round here and the distance between the cut and the line here let me take this out be able to see better the, the distance between the cut and the line here is about 10 thousandths. That will give us about, when I've done the exhaust, four inches across, four inch 30 across the bore, give or take about 10 thousandths. It's close enough. Now you can also see I've cut the top cut of the seat. Well, this is the 30 degree top cut. At this point, once you've established a base with the downward cut of this tool, this tool here then I cut a 30 degree top cut two inches wide for this 194 right so now we've established this here the floor and this top cut here right with, with that we will get we will neatly snug our 1.94 valve in here and be able to machine the bowl there so let me just finish machining all these here and we'll move on to the next stage. Just so that you know what I'm talking about, here's my Goodson bowl hog. I should show it up this way, then you can see how the cutter here, the cutter here cuts the form. Well here's what our Goodson bowl hog does. It takes a whole bunch of metal out in the bowl as you might have guessed from its uh, name but also it puts the right angle on this edge here. Uh, bowl hog works very well in this instance, it doesn't work in every instance although I suspect that some of the times it doesn't work as well as it could do is because something else in the bowl may be wrong but that's open to interpretation the principal detail I want you to notice here are the seats um, they're outlined in black here right now you might well wonder why I've cut the seats and I haven't finished the chambers well that is because we are going to 
de-shroud this in a proper geometric fashion not that old guesswork that you see so often I'll show you how that's done in a, in a few moments but what I want you to notice and I know I've pointed it out in other places here in this video is this bowl here take a good look at that there this side here for the first about half an inch is leaning by 10 degrees and then it straightens up and goes into here that's so that we can get a good radius for the gases coming over like this same at the back here this this bit from about here down to about here is 10 degrees this here is not it's all it, there's a small radius there and it's straight off that corner as is the case here with the exhaust we have a about, ooh, about a 15 degree angle like that coming off there then it goes into a, a, the radius right and that's so the exhaust gases can flow out like this uh, I don't think there's much I, I can show you from the exhaust port here but we'll take a look at that later I'll, I'll go through and detail it and we'll do some molds Our deshrouding procedure starts with the use of a quarter ball bearing. Mm -hmm. This is a flow ball. I've put their address up before and their contact details, but I'll put them up again. Now, let's look at how this works. Right here, we've lifted the valve a quarter of an inch, right? You see how it comes through in an unshrouded area here. But now, as we go round, so we find we can't pull it out what this means is the wall here is too close right so what we're going to do is we are going to relieve that so that this ball will pull through now there's a limit that we can do it although it would like to, the check in terms of flow the chamber would like to be reshaped quite a bit here that's where they crack so cracking region is across here now I'm sure that a lot of head porters knew they were going to crack and when I was doing these Formula 5000 slash sports um, GT sports stuff like Lola's and that they were buying a set of heads for every meet and uh, that was like $2,500 maybe even $3,000 back in 1970 yeah 1970 so we want this to live part of the reason we used a smaller valve is there's more clearance between here and here so we we don't need to deshroud as much now once we've done it with this ball we'll graduate to a bigger one and we'll work this here again there's a limit to how much we can do this without it cracking so follow my instructions there let me first do this one where each zone of deshrouding occurs with these flow balls first off we have the quarter inch one which will come out lift it there and you'll see that it's pretty much a dead fit in there will be by the time i've emerged it right and that goes round to there from there right round now then, now remember that point there. This is where it gets bigger going that way. So the next ball we have is a 5 16 right? That will not make it out through there, but when we get to about here, let's lift this to the requisite amount. There we go. When it gets around to about here, right, it should pull through. There we go, it should pull through. So from there to about here is the 5 16 ball. This isn't quite pulling through yet, but, but it will do when I've emerged it. Then we go to the 3 8 ball. Right. That, you lift the valve to 3 8 
right and that will pull through from there to just there and then the last bit is a 7 16 ball and I want you to note how I deal with the spark plug area right this pulls out just at the last bit by the spark plug hole right just there now then a little point to note here is this area here if you look at the other cylinders you'll see that the spark plug kind of sinks in here well you take that lip off there and bring it level with this here just just that there now what this represents is the best compromise between staying reliable uh, in terms of cracking yet getting the airflow so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clean this area up here and we'll just do a final check next step is we're going to uh, emery the chamber to the final shape right not much to come off makes it a lot easier to do this by cutting a, a three inch disc available from Harbor Freight to about two inches you can actually get them at two inches now see how that fits in there pretty good now just so that we don't cut lots of lines we're going to put little tabs in here uh, point to note here this is this cutting this emery stuff is very hard on scissors I bought these at Harbor Freight about four years ago and with all the grinding I do and cut, trimming of these they still cut right uh, so they got a life so far about four times a normal pair of scissors 4.99 as well right here we go when we just lightly fold the edges up here like this and we are ready to go and here's what that side of the chamber looks like when it's done when you're doing this be sure not to go over the gasket marks in fact you should stay that ten thousandths away from them here's our 165 valve in place we're going to pull off a procedure similar to what we did with the intake right first we but there is a difference I should have said that what we're going to do is we're going to area rule this port right the flow is at low lift is not really affected much by the discharge coefficient because it's supersonic and it's affected more by the area so we have to make sure that this I should have said it's supersonic up into the 150 200 range so we're going to area rule the port and the valve so that there's the maximum area right at 250 so that's the, our first job is to deshroud and that might need some port work to do just off the seat but we're going to deshroud this area here right so that's our first move okay here's one side of the exhaust done relevant points are that we do not go over the gasket line here I slipped there but this head's got to be skimmed about 40 thousandths right now this area here you could undercut it so this is further that way than that line do that so that we can just get this quarter inch ball to come out there right like so right to about there almost comes out there now then that's about all the deshrouding we have to do on that side and here's why 
If we deshroud this side too much, it slows the exhaust flow on the floor of the port there. And what that does is it makes the engine seem more cammy. In other words, it doesn't come up on the cam quite as soon, right? It serves no useful purpose to take this back any further other than to reduce output, right? So that's it there. So it's shaved very slightly in here, right? That's it. Now we're going to focus our attention on this side of the valve and what we do here. This is an important step. Here's how what I call a hyperscavenge plateau. I used to just call it plateau, but now it's a scavenge plateau and then a hyperscavenge. And it works really well. When the piston comes up at the end of the exhaust stroke, it gets very close to the cylinder head, right? And it squeezes out the gases from between the quench pad and the piston. And they come out at amazingly high speed at the edge of the plateau with a tight quench. They can be going over 500 miles an hour, right? Now, if you've got a conventional a heart shaped chamber, you're going you're gonna to be asking the the exhaust gases which are going at 500 miles an hour just here to be able to make that turn and go out well guess what most of it doesn't right what happens is it goes straight over the top of the valve and you lose that energy in amongst all of this uh, mixed up intake and exhaust charge now what we are going to do is we are going to cut here, right around here, and flatten this area out so that when the quench comes, it makes it round this turn and goes straight out the valve. That, increase, that increases the scavenge on the chamber and it increases the flow on the far side of the valve. Right, so now you know why we didn't shroud it because the gas is coming out of here could interfere with that and this is the best way to get it out not that so let's get grinding here and cut that here's the plateau roughed out uh, make sure you carry this form through here and you can do a little bit of undercutting here don't go over the gasket line be sure when you do this that you start off cutting down here more than here so that that surface curves into the seat right don't go past the top cut that's on there because you'll need that for final blending anyway that's my next move is to to blend that now some of you are going to ask do we do the same over here no this is a no-go area here any more deshrouding than that you're going to lose flow At this point, you'll see why I left two or three thousandths on the valve seats. Using a tool like this, this is a flat disc which I've cut these little uh, windmill ends, and then I go into the port. Like so, and polish the immediate space under the seat take off the corners on the seat and then radius the top of the seat into the actual seat itself. Now this will have taken a couple of thousands off the seat and maybe made it not hyper accurate but we're just going to touch the two seats now just to bring them back into being. Well, I could attempt a guided tour of the port here, or the ports, but it occurred to me that uh, it would be a very cursory deal. There's really only a couple of points that you can see from the outside looking in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out those things that you can see better from the outside looking in. Then we'll do a guided tour of a port mold. What you're seeing here 
is the view down the intake port. One of the difficult things to see from a mould is the size difference between the top and bottom of the port. Remember, this is the roof of the port, this is the floor. It's upside down here for lighting. Now, notice how it's much wider down here. Up here, there's virtually no material been taken off here. Now, this is an important move, right? Taking material off here doesn't help the flow. It cuts port velocity and cuts port energy. There is nothing to be gained. All the air is up here. Take note of what I tell you when we look at a port mold. Side view of port, points to note. See there's almost no radius here. It comes off the seat just shy of 90 degrees, right? It goes straight to about here, then it curves round. This curve here is the sharpest here and gets less as it goes round. Right, note here, this curve here, and the fact that I've got more of a radius on there. Also, see how, uh, well, can't see it easy here, but the floor from about here, the floor of the port from about here, all the way to about here is rough not so on the roof. Now let's look at it from another angle. The way I have this positioned here, the manifold faces straight like that. Notice the port is sweeping across. You will see that there is an enlargement along this wall here to partially compensate for the pinch point. Also, across the top of the port, it is widened as much as possible. Not so with the bottom. That is as near stock as possible. Not much flows down there. Note how this turn here is a very generous and gentle turn into this side here, which is the cylinder center. That cylinder center is, now let me get around there, is down like that there. On the other hand, you should be able to see that this is much bigger here and that the high speed flow that is mostly in this top corner here goes down there, can get to here and it's got plenty of room between it and the guide so that it swings around easier in a swirling action. You'll notice from our swirl tests on the heads that the swirl was pretty good. And that's good for low speed torque, especially if you're going to use a set of heads like this on the street. The bowl area of any porting job is the most critical out of the lot, notwithstanding that it's had a, got a good seat job done on it. Center of the cylinder is here. Chevy port is angled across like this. It, most of the air is flowing on this side or would like to. So you cut the port where the air wants to go, not where you think it should go. So come around here, you'll notice how much wider it is here than here. That is because 60% of the air is on this side of the guide here and only about 40% on the other. Notice it's bulged out and the port has a general lean on it. If we did the center line of the port between there and there, compared to the center of the valve, it's lent over like this. This area here has the 10 degree slope on it that I mentioned from my Goodson cutter. 
this here is leaning probably around about eight degrees the other way right the this part of the bowl from there to there right down to the seat is the critical part make sure this turn here and I've said this before is as smooth as possible into the bowl here although only 40% of the air flows here we'd like to make sure that as much as possible can go down here consistent with it always being less than what's over here right and I think that covers what I'm going to say there cylinder center here again see how because the gases are coming out at an angle like this how this here is bulged out whereas this side isn't there's much more clearance between this side of the valve stem and this side again we've cut the, this port so that there's adequate valve stem length here to keep the valves cool well this would be a good road racing port right uh, very little taken off the length of the, the the guide now note that the lean on this very important it's about this much our flow bench program indicates that this port actually needs more lean but i'm concerned with the thickness of the casting right if i had a brand new casting to work with and sonic it all and it was in good shape i'm pretty sure i could get to close to 210 cfm out of this port here right by giving it more lean i have to go to 700 to do that but hey that's it this is not the ultimate port i save my ultimate ports for vintage racing so if anyone wants a vintage head for racing done i can do it it's going to cost you about three grand for just the porting anyway uh, this is 199 cfm at 700 but we're not lifting there we're only lifting to about 600 on this engine so we we can access i think it's 192 or 194 at 600. points to note here comes off here quite sharp into this turn here right there's not a super amount you can do to this at high lift you want to keep the flow off of this side of the port and have it work on this side well from about this point right round to about here don't particularly want it to flow well here because that will cause a low speed amount at the bottom of the port and it will reverse flow easier okay points to note here are this area here coming into the port and the fact that it's leaning there the gases are going out like this notice this is much larger here than here right the direction of the flow literally at high lift is the mass flow is moving in about that direction there again i'd like to put a bit more uh, bias on here but we've got a casting thickness problem now let me turn it all the way around well let's stop there first you can see from this what a big bulge this is here this is the cylinder wall side right and we go around a bit more here and you'll also see that this enlarging is carried on all the way until it fades out where the uh, port ends at the manifold face so it's bulged out the bulge gets slowly less and less and less as it comes around here so the area of the port's getting more and more so it needs it less
so that you can get some idea of the performance of our uh, modified 186 heads I am going to uh, make a comparison with a well proven I say well proven we recently dyno tested a set of AFR enforcers and they worked very well we zipped by the 500 horsepower mark no sweat whatsoever here are the two intake curves compared here's our 186 casting here is the AFR casting now bear in mind we do have a 194 valve in here compared with the 202 valve there so you can see intake wise we've done very well even down here we've got more flow than the uh, enforcer head so now let's take a look at the exhaust well here's our exhaust you can see that it's topping out at almost 200 cfm there but it has a healthy advantage on an already good aftermarket head and as cast aftermarket head right so you can see that for our efforts here we've managed to pull a lot of flow and if we've already got these iron castings we've got this superior flow to a out of the box well sorted aftermarket as cast cylinder head As you may expect, more intake flow from essentially a smaller valve should mean more efficiency and that's just what we see. When we look at the discharge coefficient, that's the efficiency with which the port and valve combination runs, we see our 186 casting does very well. You'll see here it's up to about 83% efficient and that's very good that's seat work the AFR heads are well known in the industry for being or having a very well proportioned seats to give good low lift flow and that's what we see here this is a good curve for an aftermarket head amongst the best so once again our handiwork here has shown top quality results at least on the intake now let's look and see what happens when we analyze the bigger valve on the exhaust well here we have the exhaust as you can see here the efficiency of the AFR head at low lift was very high that uh, goes along with my comment earlier the AFR has some of the uh, produces some of the most efficient conventional valve seats in the market there's proof of it right there now ours is lower there that's because th we sacrificed some flow efficiency for area well when the port was area ruled and it shows up here not quite as much efficiency but a port more apt to do well for the job now once we get to about 150 thousandths lift the valve seat begins to lose its dominance of the situation and we see again this is all due to port down here of our uh, 186 uh, head casting with its 1.65 valve remember that's a bigger valve right and it holds its own right up until here which is well beyond the lift that we'll be using I'm sure by now you've all heard that flow figures are not the be all and end all of producing horsepower and that's exactly correct unfortunately most of the people who will tell you that can't seem to get any further than that fortunately we can we can take this right to the end of the road what we're looking at here is the mean velocity of the port the target number for the intake is around about 300 at the valve lift that we're going to use and that's about here so we, we just about make it with about 302 right our AFR enforcer 
which as I said is a very functional cylinder head is beaten everywhere so what can we expect we can expect this cylinder head to be very good on foot pounds of torque right also this lays the format for the ultimate horsepower determination factor which we'll get to in a moment here's exhaust port velocity as you can see our 186 casting has a very good uh, lead in this shootout here now what's the importance of port velocity on the exhaust simple this determines how well the engine comes on the cam in the first instance that's if it's good down here and secondly if it's good everywhere else up here it has a great deal to do with how well the the exhaust scavenges the combustion chamber uh, during the overlap period right this higher velocity here generates a bigger reverse wave so that's an advantage for us now here's a really telltale point here port energy this is a function of the mass of air going out the exhaust and the velocity which it goes out the more port energy we have on the intake the better it rams the cylinder at the end of the intake cycle well in fact if it builds up enough velocity the better it rams the cylinder throughout the induction pulse and into the uh, degrees of duration past bottom dead center you can see that the AFR is good ours is better on to exhaust port energy once again our 186 head casting our 50 plus year old 186 head casting can be made to produce better results than a current high performance proven aftermarket aluminum head from a reputable company like AFR right there we go that should give you a good idea of what we've achieved and last on the list for our port analysis is swirl here's our swirl curve I don't have anything that I can immediately compare it to but uh, it not in graphical form but this here is a very good curve it rivals that of a Vortec cylinder head which makes very good low speed torque so we can expect good low speed torque from this head now there are some people in the porting business will say too much swirl on a high performance head and the power goes down yes that can be the case if you have a carburetor or carburetors that deliver two larger fuel droplets you'll find that this high swirl can centrifuge those large droplets onto the wall of the port your problem is not too much swirl it's it's not enough or good enough atomization so you need to look into that good carburetor this swirl curve works extremely well for a street motor turning up to 7000 rpm now let's look at its horsepower potential remember the IOP program that I'm using can do this to within close limits so let's take a look at that well here is our opening and closing page of the IOP uh, program and uh, I've already put in the mean port area and the flow the intake flow at the lift we're going to use which would be about 600 I've also entered the compression ratio and basically modeled a 302 engine on here best torque that it's going to achieve is 425 foot-pounds best horsepower based on cylinder head 
port area limitations, 531. But the best port of, uh, horsepower it will produce on airflow limitations is higher. What we're going to find is we will probably just go by this, right? Now, in reality, what we found was some years ago with a 302 with heads like, sorry, a 327 with heads like this is that it surpassed the 500, uh, uh, the 550 horsepower mark, even though it was supposed only to make about this much. But that's because it did take advantage of this extra airflow. And, and the head worked very well. Our foot pounds was up to about 445, 450 foot pounds. That's on a 10 and a half to one compression. So it's very streetable and you can expect good results from it. That, and these numbers do assume you have the right camshaft, a good intake manifold and a good exhaust. And you know how to build engines. So let's see what happens if we turn it into a racer and put in a modest 12 and a half to one compression ratio. What are we going to get? Best torque, 470 foot pounds. Best horsepower, 587. Now then, that looks like a big number. It is, it's going to take a tunnel ram, right? However, I can verify that on a race 302 with a single four barrel, we did make 550. So that number may not be too far off. And that was some years ago. No fancy one millimeter rings or things like that. It was good old 16th inch rings. So that cylinder head has great potential. But I know a lot of you may want to use it on a 350. Let's take a look at that. Here we are with the 350's input, right? Increase the stroke. Our best torque should be around about 493 foot-pounds. Well, we haven't been quite up to that with a single four barrel, but we have seen about 476 to 480. I'm thinking that with a tunnel ram on, that it will do this number with a 10.5 to one compression. Horsepower limitation on a single four barrel would be about 531, right? But you're likely to see probably 550 uh, in reality because there's enough air for it. Well that brings us to the end of our uh, adventures with an early casting. Hopefully you've learned a lot more than just the fact that these castings can produce good results if you know how. Like I said earlier, it's not that they're full of technology we didn't know back then. It's that we have better technology now to make the most of them, at least out of my school here. I don't know how other people get on with these, but certainly we find that what we're doing here pays off when it comes to going down the drag strip or going around a road course. Now, let me say, because I don't want you to forget this, just remember, we run a porting school here website going across the bottom there and we will teach you stuff that you cannot learn in any other porting school on the face of the planet. Just check up with those other porting schools and ask them if they can tell us all about the stuff you're just seeing in these uh, videos. The reality is we're only scratching the surface here of what we will teach you. I don't care if you're already top echelon head porter. You'll learn if, if you come over here. Nobody else teaching this stuff has had their stuff on F1 engines, except me. Now, the other thing I want you to do is please like, subscribe, and request notification, and make those comments, right? If you've got something that will improve our performance, good for you. We want to hear about it. We're here to help you. I need you to help us help you, if that makes sense. Thank you.